The, the um, cheekbones were flattened. The nose bone was not visible at all. The pinky fingers on both hands, the third digit the, the, was missing from the pinky. There were calcium deposits in the baby's heart. And she said, um, I've never seen a baby um, show this many signs on an ultrasound and not be born without Down syndrome. When the doctor left the room, I stood up and immediately canceled this diagnosis. This was Satan trying to attack what God had as a plan for our family, and I canceled the diagnosis immediately. For a complete report on this story, go to awmi.net and click on today's news feature. Invest yourself in Andrew Womack Ministries today. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm concluding a series that I've been doing for four weeks entitled Redemption. This is actually a teaching that I did live at one of our Gospel Truth seminars in the Los Angeles area. And we put out a five-part teaching entitled Redemption. The last teaching in this five-part set is entitled A Better Redemption. And that's what we're offering today as our free gift. Today is also going to be the last day that we offer this entire album. So I really want to encourage you to get this. I've been talking about some truths like Ephesians 1, 7 says that redemption is the forgiveness of our sins. And I've been talking about what it means to have our sins forgiven. You know, that's a very common statement. Just about all Christians would say, oh, yes, my sins are forgiven. But then they really don't understand what that means. They still bear condemnation and a feeling of guilt and unworthiness, even though they say their sins are forgiven. They think that every time they commit a new sin, that that has to get put under the blood when the Bible teaches that we've been forgiven of all sins, past, present, and even the ones we haven't committed yet. And to help make this clear, I've had to counter the Old Testament law that focuses our attention upon sin. I've been using a lot of scriptures to show that we were redeemed from the curse of the Old Testament law. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18 says that the Old Testament law has been disannulled. Chapter 8, the last verse says that the law is ready to vanish away for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. And I've just been using a lot of scriptures uh, showing that we've been redeemed from the law. And then the last few days, I've been taking specific scriptures in the New Testament that talk about what the law accomplishes. And contrary to what most people think, the law doesn't really accomplish good things. It makes everything worse. And I know that some people are offended by this, but this is exactly what the Scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law strengthened sin. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 says, The law was a ministration of death, not something that Jesus associates himself with in the New Testament, and yet the law is a ministration of death. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says, The law is a ministration of condemnation. Then we were using Romans chapter 3, verse 19, and it says that the law stopped our excuses, shut our mouth, and made us guilty before God. It also says in verse 20 that the law gave knowledge of sin. It fo always focuses on sin. It doesn't ever focus on the answer to sin. It doesn't focus on the grace of God and show you the goodness of God. It only shows you your unworthiness. That's the purpose of the law. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. You know, I just can't even begin to say how radical of a statement that is. And yet most people pass over this and don't apply it and therefore don't get the benefit. But this is saying that being righteous with God is now available without adhering to the law and trying to live up to a certain standard. And I know that there's people watching this program say, well, you keep using this term, the law. I don't offer sacrifices, and I don't keep the feast days, and I'm not under the law. 
Well, if you have a concept that you've got to live holy and do what's right and uh, before God will answer your prayers or use you or bless you, then you are living under law. It's like you are going to the same destination that the Old Testament law and the command to be circumcised and the command to keep the Sabbath and the command to not walk so many steps on the Sabbath day and you've got to keep all of the feast and all of this. You no longer are riding in that same vehicle. You've now switched. You've got a different vehicle, but you're headed to the same destination thinking that you've got to accomplish so many things before God will give you back what it is that you desire. That is law. We have changed some of the things. Today, it's you've got to go to church and you've got to read the Bible and you've got to pray and you've got to be holy and you've got to do good and you can't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. And we now have a dis different standard, but it's the same legal mentality. And so this is saying that being righteous with God without keeping the law is now obvious, manifest available to everyone. And it goes on to say, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, see, some people would say, well, what you're saying is completely opposite the law. No, nope. even the Old Testament law prophesied the end of itself. The Old Testament prophesied that there was coming a better and uh, much better covenant. Moses, the guy who gave the law, says, God is going to raise you up a prophet like unto myself, and him you will hear. And did you know that Moses, his exact words were quoted over in Romans chapter 10 by the Apostle Paul saying, What says the word? It's nigh thee, even in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. Prior to that, he had quoted from Moses saying, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from the dead. See, Moses said these same things. He says, the word that I'm preaching, this new covenant that this new prophet is going to bring in is going to be a word that you don't have to ascend into heaven based on your own goodness. It's not you living up to some standard. And it's also not you going down to hell and doing penance and suffering for your own sin. That would be like to bring up Christ from the dead. But it's just simply that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Boy, those are powerful truths. So the Old Testament law prophesied this. This isn't contrary to the law. The law was only a temporary way of restraining the amount of sin, increasing the damage that sin did so that you would realize how deadly it was and turn from it. But the fear of this punishment caused you to commit less sin and it shuts you up unto the faith which would afterwards be revealed. And so even the Old Testament law said that all of these things were going to happen and that there would cease to be this law mentality in relationship with God. Man, that's exactly what these scriptures are saying. So it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. In other words, not upon those who have now promised that they'd quit doing this and have overcome this sin and no longer uh, steal or do this. No, it's just if you will believe, you can be made righteous in the sight of God. In verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ whom God has set forth to be the propitiation. The word propitiation means the atoning sacrifice, or uh, you could relate it to the mercy seat in the Old Testament where God met with man in mercy and not in judgment. God has made him to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the four parents of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of them which believe in Jesus. And, you know, I hate to skip any of these verses, but I've got a lot to say, so let's drop down to Romans chapter 4 in verse 15. It says, Because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So here's what all of these scriptures have been saying. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, The law strengthens sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, the law killed. Verse 9, the law condemned. 
Romans 3.19, the law stopped your mouth and made you guilty. Romans 3.20, it gave you the knowledge of sin. And then we've been reading these other verses. Romans chapter 4, verse 15, the law worked wrath. It released God's wrath and punishment. Why would you want to keep embracing something that just brought you under condemnation, death, killed you, released the wrath of God, made you sin conscious, guilty, and condemned before God? Well, those are strong statements. Here's some more scriptures about the law. And again, there's so many. I've, I've missed a bunch of really powerful ones right here in chapter 5 and chapter 6. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, it says, But now we are delivered from the law. What part of delivered from the law do we not understand? It says we're delivered from the law. That means you aren't under it anymore. That means it doesn't have any control over you anymore unless you believe a lie and go back and voluntarily submit and think that I've got to do all of these things for God to love me. And when you do that, all of a sudden this strength of sin rises, the death, the condemnation, the guilt, the focus on sin, the knowledge of sin, all of those things begin to function again if you put yourself voluntarily back under it. But it says, now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, talking about that old man, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. The apostle Paul was not saying that the law is sin. Likewise, I am not saying that the law is sin. But let me say this. If nobody has ever spoken these kind of things about the law, that has never made this question all right? Well, are you saying that the law is sin? Are you saying that we just, you know, that the law is a terrible, bad thing? If that thought never comes to you, then you haven't heard the same ministry that the Apostle Paul gave. That's a strong statement. And there are many of you that have gone to church for 20 and 30 years and have never one time thought, well, is the law a bad thing? No, that's not what we're saying. But if that thought doesn't come to you, then you haven't heard the true gospel because the true gospel has to make a separation, a break between the Old Testament law and the New Testament grace. Those two covenants are opposites. They're different ways of approaching unto God. You can't live under both of those covenants at the same time. So he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment. Now, here's another thing that the law did. The law gave sin an occasion. You know, if you go back to this illustration out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, the sting of death is sin. When you get stung, an insect releases something into you. When you got stung, it released death. Sin is what did all of that, but it was in such doses that a lot of people didn't realize what they had. And so therefore, they didn't even think they had a problem. They thought I, they were comparing themselves among themselves. So what the law did, it would be like somebody who was infected with something and then all of a sudden, somebody just increases the effect of that poison that's in your body. And all of a sudden now there's extreme pain and swelling and burning and rashes and all of these things. Those are terrible effects. But if that all of a sudden made you realize something is in me that's got to get fixed, and if that made you run and try and get a treatment, then you know what? That would actually be a positive thing. Well, we had all been infected or injected with sin but we didn't realize how bad it was. So God gave the law that amplified sin and made it come alive and start having all of these terrible consequences in our life. And it was good. The law was good in the sense that it made us hurt. It made us have so much pain that we couldn't ignore it any longer, that we were a sinner and we had to run to God for help. That's what the law was given for. But one of the slickest deceptions that has ever been put forth by the devil is where he got the church basically to portray the law as something to help us to overcome sin. That's not true. The law was given to help sin overcome us. 
And that's what this is saying. It said, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. The word concupiscence here means uncontrolled, unrestrained, lust. For without the law, sin was dead. And then look at the next verse. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Why would God give something that would make sin revive? Because the truth is, again, you were infected with this disease called sin. It was killing you, but you, it was so subtle that you didn't know what was happening, so God just increased the symptoms. He increased the damage so that you would have to deal with it, so that you would have to search out for the antidote, the cure to this thing. And so that's what it did. Sin, you were alive without the law once. It'd be like a person who was saying, well, I was feeling fine, but then all of a sudden this person gave me this pill, and when they did that, man, I started having all of these terrible things. Well, the pill didn't infect you. All the pill did was amplify the sickness that was already on the inside of you and brought it to the surface to where you could no longer ignore it and think you were healthy when the truth was you were in the process of dying. Man, that's a great illustration, I think. That's what this was. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Again, if you could imagine a person having a sickness in their body, who they were dying by, but they were, it was so subtle, they didn't think they had a problem. And then I come along and give you a pill, which the pill doesn't make you sick at all. All it does is cause the symptoms of the disease you already have to intensify and magnify. Then you might think, well, that pill, look what it did to me. No, the pill didn't do anything except draw out what was already there. That's what the law did. The law just took the sin that was already on the inside of us and it magnified it, gave it occasion against us so that we could recognize that, God, you know, if this is what sin really is, I'm in big trouble. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that was the purpose of the law. So I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Again, if I gave you a pill, and all of these symptoms flared up, and you say, that pill, look what it did. No, all the pill did was just activate the sickness that was already on the inside of it. It's the sickness that was the problem, not the pill that aggravated it. It was sin that was the problem, not law that brought out that sin and aggravated and amplified it. So he says, was that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Going back to my analogy, so that the sickness you had could all of a sudden flare up and become so painful that it would, you would become extremely sick. You already had the sickness, but you weren't aware of it, and so you were ignoring the treatment. So we give you an injection or a pill that makes that sickness flare up and become so that you can't ignore it. It becomes exceedingly uh, bad, exceedingly sinful. That's what the law did. In verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Anyway, there's so much more that I can say about this, but all of these scriptures, you know what it's basically doing? It's putting a totally different light on the Old Testament law than what most people have. I know that when I was raised in the church and told that you shall not do this and you shall not do that and if you violate this, God won't answer your prayers and you're going to be punished, it motivated me to try and seek God. But at the same time, did you know the sin that I committed and every person sins? I don't care if you're a legalist trying to serve God and keep the law or if you are out there as an ungodly person Everybody sins. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. The sin that I committed probably devastated me more than it did you. 
And again, if you've heard my testimony, I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've lived a super godly life compared to most people. And yet, I believe that I was probably more condemned than most of you. For instance, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never taken a puff of a cigarette. Now, you can debate whether that's really sin or not. I don't believe that you go to hell for smoking a cigarette. You might smell like you've been there, but you won't go to hell if you smoke a cigarette. But did you know that the religious system I was brought up under basically taught that this was a sin that would send you to hell? And even though I never did it myself, did you know I had a reoccurring nightmare? I mean, this happened for years. It may have happened for a decade, at least once or twice a year, about every six months. I would have a reoccurring nightmare that I had smoked a cigarette and I got caught and they turned me into the cops. And worse than the cops, the cops turned me over to my mother. And boy, my mother was so irate. And anyway, this dream always wound up with me burning in hell and being punished for eternity because I'd smoked one cigarette. Now, some of you think, boy, you are a mess. And it's absolutely true. You know what that law did? It kept me from committing the sin. Or I'm not, it's not sin in the sense that you're going to go to hell, but it is damaging to your body. And you know what? I believe that we are the temple of the Lord and we are supposed to glorify God in what we do. So I think it's wrong to smoke. And it kept me from smoking because I was so fearful of punishment. But I probably felt more guilt-ridden and sinful, even though I didn't even commit that sin, than many of you who smoked like a stovepipe. And you know what? It's because the law amplified, even the thought, even the desire, even the lust for sin became so vile to me. You know, uh, profanity was something I've never spoken. I've never used all those expletives and done those things. And yet I would see profanity scribbled on a bathroom stall, and I'd get condemned because I even read it, because I had the thought come to me. And I would spend days and weeks repenting over what somebody else wrote in a bathroom stall, and I'd be defiled by it. I know some of you are thinking, man, you were really religious. Well, I was, and I'm saying that that's what the law does to you. It amplifies sin. It makes sin become so exceedingly sinful that just the slightest little thing. I lived under probably more guilt and more condemnation than some of you who are out getting drunk and committing adultery and doing all kinds of things, and you probably didn't feel at near as guilty and condemned as I was who was living a comparatively holy life. See, the law amplifies sin. And there were some good benefits to it. You know what? Today, I don't have to go back and deal with the memories that some of you do for what you did. And so there may be some benefit to that. But, you know, overall, I lived under a condemnation that I had to renew my mind. And it was probably harder for me to embrace these truths about redemption than it is for any of you. I lived under a terrible condemnation, but I tell you what, God has set me free, not so that I could go live in sin, but set me free from the condemnation and the guilt associated with sin. He's cured me of that disease. That doesn't mean that I never sin, but it means that all of the sins that I commit have already been forgiven, and the guilt and the condemnation and the punishment was placed on Jesus, and I don't have to bear it. We have redemption, a better redemption than anything the Old Testament law could do. You know, today is my last day to deal with this fifth teaching in my five-part set. It's our last day to offer you the five-part set entitled Redemption. And so I really want to encourage you, you need to get these truths. They would make a tremendous difference in your life. So our announcer is going to share all of that information with you, and I just want to encourage you to go to the effort to write or call and request these materials. They'd be a blessing. So please listen, please respond, and then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled Redemption was recorded live at a recent gospel truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD. Each is available for 16 pounds. 
Request item T1056C for the CD or T3201D for the DVD. Or you can get the DVD as seen on TV for 16 pounds. Request item T1056D when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on MP3 downloads on the left hand side of the page. On our website, you'll also find books, newsletters, and other resources in several languages. Just click a flag on the right side of the screen to see what's available. The fifth teaching in the Redemption series titled, A Better Redemption, is available on CD for three pounds. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fifth CD free of charge when you write or call. Request item TK140C. We'd also like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled, Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith, is available in hardback for 12 pounds 50. Request book T228. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Warwickshire, England for the Grace and Faith Family Camp, May 28th through the 31st. For those of you looking forward to our annual Summer Family Bible Conference, remember to mark your calendars and join us in Colorado Springs, June 28th through July 2nd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. She said that the um, cheekbones were flattened. The nose bone was not visible at all. The pinky fingers on both hands, the third digit the, the, was missing from the pinky. There were calcium deposits in the baby's heart. And she said, um, I've never seen a baby um, show this many signs on an ultrasound and not be born without Down syndrome. When the doctor left the room, I stood up and immediately canceled this diagnosis. This was Satan trying to attack what God had as a plan for our family, and I canceled the diagnosis immediately. For a complete report on this story, go to awmi.net and click on today's news feature. Invest yourself in Andrew Womack Ministries today. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth.